now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Well, Jello again, friends. You know we couldn't let a Sunday episode of Classic Radio Theater go by without an episode of the Jack Benny program. This episode is actually the Jello program starring Jack Benny going back to June 25th, 1939. And this episode comes to us from Jack's hometown, Waukegan. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O Program, coming to you from Waukegan, Illinois, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Waukegan. Our last broadcast of the season is coming to you from the stage of the Genesee Theater in Waukegan, Illinois. Yes, sir. Jell-O again, folks. Please, Jack, wait till I introduce you. Oh, pardon me, I'm nervous. On a certain Valentine's Day many years ago, a stork flew over this fair city and dropped a little bundle of joy. <laughs> and who do you think this bundle was? Uh, Jello again. The Jack, ja- will you please wait a minute? Don, who was born here, you or me? <laughs> For heaven's sake. So without further ado, I bring you that local boy who surprised everybody by making good, Jack Benny. Thank you. Hello again. This is Bundle Benny talking. And it's about time. Gosh, Don, I've been so thrilled and excited the last few days that, well, really, I don't know where I'm at or what I'm doing. Well, I can certainly appreciate that. (laughs) You look it. (laughs) Well, you know, Don, I spent the last four days just renewing old acquaintances and visiting all my old hangouts. What a time I've been having. Well, who'd you see, Jack? Oh, everybody. Ollie Eimerman, Stubb Wilbur, Cliff Gordon. And yesterday, I dropped into Bobby O'Farrell's pool room. I haven't seen Bobby in 15 years. Hey, I'll bet he was thrilled to death. Was he? Why, the minute I walked in, he said to me, Jack, will you ever forget the day you were showing off and you ripped a hole in the cloth on the billiard table? (laughs) I said, I sure do, Bobby. And he said, that'll be $3. Oh. Oh, he was just tickled to death. <laughs> and how? Oh, uh, by the way, Jack, did you see that pal of yours that you're always talking about? Uh, oh, you know, the fellow that runs the clothing store. Oh, you mean Julius. Julius Senekin. That's the fellow. Was he glad to see you? Glad to see me. Don, when I walked into a store, there were tears in his eyes as he jumped over the counter, threw his arms around me and said, Yes, sir, what can I do for you? <laughs> Before I got out of there, I had three Palm Beach suits and a raccoon coat. <laughs> you must have been kidding, you know. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. How's the Waukegan kid? Oh, I'm swell, Phil. Have you been having a good time? I'll say, but you know what happened last night, Jack? No, what? Well, a bunch of us fellas were sitting up in my hotel room, just yeah. sitting in my room, and yeah. we were singing and laughing and making a lot of noise, and the first thing you know, a couple of cops came up and took us to the hoose gal. Took you to the who's guy. Wait a minute, Phil. You mean to say they put you in jail? Those weren't candy bars I was looking through. <laughs> well, for heaven's sake, why didn't you call me? I'd have had the mayor, Bitey Talcott, fix it up. He could have taken care of that. He could, eh? He was with us. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I should have warned him about you. So you and the mayor have been palling around together, eh? Yeah, he thinks I'm a riot. Yeah. Listen, Phil, I know Bitey Talcott pretty well. He isn't going to fall for that corny chatter of yours. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. How are you? <laughs> well, Mary, here we are in my hometown. Are you enjoying yourself? Am I? Gee, everybody's been so wonderful to me. I've been out sightseeing every day. Hey, you don't have to get nervous. This is my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mary, there's plenty to see here, too. Huh? You know, Jack, I even saw the house you were born in. No kidding. It's a fish market now. <laughs> a fish market? Well, of all things. But they haven't forgotten you, Jack. They haven't, eh? No, they got a big sign there that says, Jack Benny born here. Fresh mackerel daily. <laughs> well, naturally, they have to advertise what they're selling. What else did you do, Mary? Well, I went over to the City Hall Park to see that elm tree they planted in your honor. Oh, yes. Did you see that elm tree? I'll say. <laughs> What are you laughing at? There was a squirrel in it signing autographs. 
That was my uncle, Tarzan Benny. <laughs> But say, fellas, you ever notice uh, what a, for a town this size how many pretty girls there are here? You're right, Jack. The girls are beautiful. How they go for me. Oh, sure. Why, they're always staring at me. Well, Phil, Marcel's hair for men is a novelty around here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, stop taking bows. Say, Jack, uh, you told me that you used to be quite a ladies' man in this town. Have you seen any of your old girlfriends? Have I? Why, Don, only this morning I was walking down Washington Street. And who did I run into but Vivian Thompson? You know, when we were kids, she and I were kind of stuck on each other. You know, I used to write her notes, and we used to give each other presents. In fact, I still have a lock of her hair. You ought to paste it on, brother. <laughs> Never mind that. Vivian and I had quite a romance. Was she thrilled seeing you again? Well done. She, uh... Did she kiss you? I didn't put this lipstick on my forehead myself. <laughs> You know, to tell you the truth, I think she's still crazy about me. Well, if she's so crazy about you, why did she kiss you on the forehead? Because she's taller than I am. <laughs> That's why. What do you want me to do, carry a box to stand on? <laughs> anyway, let's not get into an argument here. I'm feeling too good. Me too. And I'm so grateful the way people here treated me that I wrote a poem all about Waukegan. Well, that's a fine way to pay him back. <laughs> now, go ahead. Let's hear it. Well, Jack, I'm going out in the hall for a glass of water. I'm going with you, and I never touch it. Come back here, both of you. <laughs> if I can take it, you can. Now, go ahead with your poem, Mary. What, uh, what's the title of it? Uh, to Waukegan, where Jack Benny was born in the year Never 18... mind, never mind. Read the poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, Waukegan, oh, Waukegan, on the shores of Lake Michigan. <laughs> Michigan? Jack was born here in this place. He was very pretty, except his face. I was pretty all over. <laughs> Go ahead. Once you were a little village, Indians roamed here to and fro. But now you are a great big city, and you got to buy beads in the ten-cent store. <laughs> ten-cent store? True enough, honey. Well, we certainly got to Alabama fast. <laughs> Continue. Oh. <laughs> Continue, Mary. <laughs> I like your parks. I like your streets. I like your homes. They are so neat. I like your lake. I like your boat. Your sailors really know no, their own. Old. <laughs> that so, tough. oh, Waukegan, oh, Waukegan, we'll be sad when we are leaving. But before I go, this kiss I give... To one and all, from Mary Liv, the end. Well, it's about time. <laughs> now, Mary, that was simply wonderful. Oh, Phil, do you think you can follow that with a number? Sure, Jack, I'll follow anything. I know, I've seen you on the street. <laughs> now, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes. Oh, Waukegan, here am I. Did I walk or did I fly? Is this just a dream for a chance? Oh, gee whiz, I forgot my pants. Woo! <laughs> well, I'm going to shoot him during the quail season, folks. And I'm not saying this because it's our last program of the season, Phil, but on the level, that number was really swell. Thanks, Jack. Now, if your boys played like that every week, I'd be proud that I was a member of the Musicians' Union. <laughs> I thought they threw you out. They did not. I'll show you my membership card. I got it right here in my wallet. Oh, don't take off the barbed wire just for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fine way to talk, Mary, after the way I've been spending money on you. I took you to Nolan's restaurant every single night this week for dinner. Yes, and I know why we always went to Nolan's. Never mind. Why, Mary? Fifteen years ago, Jack bought a meal ticket there, and he had eight punches left. <laughs> Well, I can't carry it around with me forever. <laughs> I'd like to take one of those punches and give it right to you, right in the nose. <laughs> 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 That's really old, oh, isn't that all? Smart on the last program. <laughs> 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 and now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a special announcement to make this evening. As you all know, tonight, immediately after our broadcast, we are having the world premiere of Paramount's new picture, Man About Town. And there are a lot of Hollywood celebrities here in our audience. Mark Sandwich, the director, Dorothy Lamour, Hedda Hopper, myself. Phil Harris. Yes, we know you're here, Phil. And incidentally, when your face appears on the screen, just applaud. Don't stamp and whistle. <laughs> you know, you're not the only one in the picture. I'm the only one with sex appeal. Well, if that isn't the hammiest remark <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> 
Listen, brother, I got more appeal than you any day, and I'll leave it to Mary. You better not. <laughs> well, then you'll just have to take my word for it, Bill. Now, let's see, where were we? Oh, yes, in addition to our Hollywood celebrities, we also have with us several distinguished guests from Waukegan. And I'd like to present to you now an old school chum of mine who, through hard work and diligent perseverance, has gone far in the field of politics. Here he is, folks, the Honorable Mansell Bidey Talcott, Mayor of Waukega. Well, well, well. Hello, Bidey. Welcome to the Jello program. Hiya, Jackson. Are you in the groove? <laughs> What? What's that? Are you diving, kid? <laughs> oh, you've been around with Harris, all right. Well, anyway, Bidey, it's sure good to see you again, and you're certainly looking fine. How do you feel? Swell, Jack. I'm right on the boom. That's on the beam. <laughs> on the beam, Bidey. Well, this stuff is new to me. Oh. It's new to everybody but Phil. Say, Mayor, why don't you give out with a couple of those gags I told you? Okay, Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> The fine mayor. I couldn't even be alderman in this town. <laughs> Let's see, where am I? Huh? Oh, here. Now, wait a minute, buddy. I'm afraid we haven't time for any of Phil's gags, but I do want to tell you how much I appreciate your coming up here tonight to take a bow. And for the hospitality you've shown the gang and myself all week. I'll never forget it. You're welcome, Jack. And believe me, that goes for the whole town. See you later. Okay, buddy. Oh, just a minute, Your Honor. Uh, before you leave, I'd like to ask you just one question. What is it, Don? Do the people in Waukegan need a lot of jello? Oh, just oodles of it. <laughs> oodles? And why do all these charming people in Waukegan eat jello? Well, because. Because it's economical, easy to make, and comes in six delicious flavors. That's right, buddy. And, uh, what are those flavors, Your Honor? Well, there's. Uh... Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks, Bidey. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Bidey, the plug is quicker than the eye, so be careful. Well, so long, Bidey. So long, Jack. Well, Phil, see you later. And we'll go out and cut a rug. Okay, man. <laughs> He sure is a nice guy. He gave me nine keys to the city already. He carries them around like lifesavers. <laughs> and now, folks, as Kenny Baker, our young tenor, was called back to Hollywood, uh, he will not be with us tonight. So for the vocal highlight of the evening, Mr. Phil Harris, the Nightingale of the South, and Miss Mary Livingston, the Plainfield Thrush, <laughs> will blend their voices in a popular little number called... Uh, that must be Bidey again. Is that you, Mayor? It sure is, Buck. Open up. Well, the Mayor of Van Nuys. Come on in, Andy. Come on in. Hiya, fellas. Well, Andy, I thought you'd never get here. What delayed you? I couldn't find the theater. Why, anybody could have told you where the Genesee Theater is. All you had to do was ask them. Well, I ask a lot of people, Buck, but every time I open my mouth, they just looked in. <laughs> well, your tonsils are intriguing. Uh, you know, Andy, uh, you should have been here a few minutes ago. You being the mayor of Van Nuys, I could have introduced you to the mayor of Waukegan. Oh, I know, buddy. I was over at the city hall with him all morning. Yeah, what were you doing? Oh, we just sat around and hammered with our gavels. <laughs> Hey, I'll bet that was a lot of fun. Hey, Andy, have you been down to Chicago yet? There's a town you ought to see. Chicago? Where's that? Oh, Andy, you know, it's that big city with the tall buildings. You know where we change trains. Is that Chicago? Certainly. Well, doggone, Bitey told me that was South Waukegan. <laughs> Well, 
He would. You better be careful, Andy. The first thing you know, he'll try and sell it to you. It's too late now, Buck. I bought it. <laughs> well, you got a marvelous buy. Well, Andy, now that you're here, stick around because, uh... Mary and Phil are going to sing a duet. You might as well hear it. No, I guess I'll go back to the hotel. I like to ride up and down in the elevator. Them things fascinate me. So long, Buck. So long, Andy. <laughs> you know, folks, Andy's getting a terrific kick out of this trip. He's never been east before. He's never even been in a hotel before. <laughs> How do you know, Phil? I walked in his room this morning and he was making the bed. <laughs> oh, he'll get by all right. Well, how about that number, kids? Are you ready? I am. Me too. Then swing it and be good now. I want them, I want to be proud of you tonight. And while Phil and Mary sing, we'll take a break. June 25th, 1939. Jack Benny here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. All right, Phil and Mary are done singing. Let's get back to the Jack Benny Show for Jello, as it was broadcast June 25th, 1939. That was The Ladies in Love, sung by Kenny Baker, and very good Kenny. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, wait a minute. Phil and I sang that number. Oh, yes. I'm so nervous. Mary, do I know what I'm doing today? No. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) That no wasn't in the script, folks. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, in a few more minutes, our little gang will bid you all adieu until next October. Say, Don. Oh, yes, Jack. Just imagine we'll all have 14 whole weeks of rest. Fourteen weeks of nice, carefree relaxation. And fourteen weeks without getting paid. Yike! (laughs) Well, I never thought of that. Say, Jack, I'm getting a little bit jumpy, are you? You mean on account of the premiere of the picture? No, Phil, I'm sure it'll go over big. Why, look at all my friends sitting out in the audience. Sid Block, Ward, Just, Mr. and Mrs. Pritchard, and there's my dad and sister. John, look at that big smile on my father's face. Yeah, he's sure thrilled. He certainly is. I don't see him. Which one is your dad? The one in Jack's blue suit. (laughs) <laughs> That's him I wish he wouldn't put on both pair of pants, though It's warm here <laughs> Say, Don, you know what I ought to do tonight As long as we're here in Waukegan? What's that, Jack? Well, after all, this is where I started on my musical career And I think it's no more than right That I play a violin solo You know <laughs> You know, my old violin teacher, Charlie Lindsay Is sitting in our audience And right there in the front row He just moved to the back row He did not <laughs> And now that Charlie is here, I think I ought to play the first number he ever taught me, the glow worm. Oh, my goodness, I'm getting out of here. Charlie, come back here. (laughs) He always was a great kidder, folks. Say, Phil, let me have a violin, will you? Okay. Here you are, Jack. It goes under your chin. I know where it goes. (laughs) Well, I better tune this fiddle up. Give me an A, boys, will you? Oh, just when I wanted to show off a little. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Oh, fine. Rochester, how many times do I have to tell you not to interrupt me in the middle of the program? What do you want? Well, boss, I'm tired of being cooped up in this hotel room with Carmichael. Oh, you are, eh? I want to get out in the sun. I'm losing my tan. <laughs> Listen, Rochester. Rochester, you'll just have to stay with that polar bear. He's homesick. By the way, is he standing the heat all right? Yeah, but I think you ought to feed him more. All we had for breakfast was three fish, two eggs, and a bottle of milk. Well, my goodness, isn't that enough? I don't think so. I caught him putting marmalade on the bellboy. <laughs> oh, he was just clowning. He was drooling, too. <laughs> Never mind. Now, Rochester, before I forget it, I want you to pack my bags because we're leaving for New York tomorrow. I'm going to see the Louis Galento fight. You won't get shiny pants watching that. <laughs> Oh, so you're still bragging about Joe Lewis, eh? Well, let me tell you something, Rochester. They don't call Galento the Iron Man for nothing. Why, he's got a chin like an anvil. An anvil? Yes. Well, Brother Lewis is going to play the course on it. (laughs) Oh, he is. Well, we'll find out. Now, get going, and I'll see you right after the premiere. All right. By the way, boss, how am I in the picture? You're very good, Rochester. You'll be a big hit. Now, go ahead and pack my bag. Okay, boss, I'll put a man on it right away. (laughs) You'll pack him yourself. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, Mr. Benny. Now what? I meant to ask you something. 
When we start on our vacation, does that mean I'm off salary for 14 weeks? It certainly does. You're just like me, Rochester. When I don't get it, you don't get it. When you get it, I don't get it. (laughs) Now, Rochester, I don't want to hear another word about it. You'll just have to take care of... Carmichael! Carmichael! What's the matter? I gotta hang up now, boss. Here comes a fat (laughs) bellboy. From 84 years ago, June 25th, 1939, Jack Benny on this final Sunday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these important messages from your favorite radio station. Just going to take a minute here to tell you about the big savings going on now, the claret sale at MyPillow.com. And you know, I've talked about how in my office, I have a pair of My Slippers, and they're really comfortable, and they're on clearance right now. The MyPillow.com slippers, $25 a pair, limit 10. And I would buy three or four more pairs. Unfortunately, they're out of my size. They also have sheets, pillowcases, clothing items, all on special right now. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the clearance tab at the top of the page, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Limited sizes remaining in the MyPillow slippers, limited colors on other items. MyPillow.com, clearance tab, promo code Wyatt, one 800 Nine two eight four seven one five. Now on this final Sunday, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt talks the conclusion of Jack Benny, June twenty fifth, nineteen thirty nine, from Jack's hometown of Waukegan, Illinois. <laughs> Between Rochester and Carmichael, I sure have my hand full. Now, let's see. Where was I? You were just about to play a violin solo, Jack. You traitor. Why'd you tell him? Mary. All right, boys, the glow worm. You know, I haven't had much time to rehearse it, folks, but I hope all my Waukegan friends will remember and recognize it. Well, I just tune up a little here. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, boy, give me an introduction to the glow worm, will you? Plink, plink. <laughs> plink, plink. We'll never get back in this town again. All quiet. <laughs> plink, plink. Plink, plink. You can talk plainer than that, brother. <laughs> well. Isn't that awful? Well, thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I could have done better if I had my own violin. And now for an encore, I will Hey, Jack, play... you haven't got time to play anything. Your picture goes on just a few minutes. What time is it? Oh, yes, you'll have to excuse me, folks. Come on, gang, let's all hurry out in the audience and see it. Gee, I'm excited. Oh, boy, wait till I get a load of me. <laughs> you, 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 that's all you think of. Oh, stop arguing. Hurry up or we'll miss the picture. Don't worry, they won't start it without me. Where are we going to sit, Jack? Don, where do you generally sit? Come on, kids, let's go, will well, you? Let's get... All right, right everybody, let's go. Well, tonight we're starting out on our summer vacation, and, uh, you know, it makes us want to leave you with a suggestion that's just swell for these hot days to come. It's crisp summer salad, the dish to spruce up the tiredest appetite. You can make it with cool golden lemon jello or tangy sea green lime, and here's what you do. Dissolve one package of jello in one pint of hot water, add one tablespoon of vinegar and a dash of salt, and chill until slightly thickened. Now... Fold in one cup each of diced cucumber, sliced radishes, and sliced young onions. 
Malden will firm and serve on crisp lettuce. Ah, there's a cool, invigorating salad that's bound to make you hungry. Shimmering jello, lemon or lime, with that wonderful extra-rich fruit flavor in the fresh summery color. And crisp, fresh vegetables molded firmly inside. So ask your grocer tomorrow for some lemon or lime jello and try this delicious summer salad. This is the last number of the last program in the current Jell-O series. And we'll be back on the air again, the whole gang and myself, next October the 8th. We have just a few minutes before the picture starts, so in the meantime, I'd like to thank my listeners for their fine support during the year, my cast for their splendid cooperation, and I'd also like to thank my authors, Bill Morrow and Ed Beloyne, who worked with me in the preparation of my material. Well, say, Jack, don't forget about our summer show. Oh, yes. Starting next Sunday, Jello will bring you the Aldrich family, which has been a feature on the Kate Smith program during the past season. And if you've been following it, you know that Ezra Stone, as Henry Aldrich, is America's funniest teenage hero. So be sure to tune in next Sunday night. Oh, Jack, can I have a bag of popcorn to eat during the show? Now, Mary, there'll be no crunching during my picture. This is a talkie, not an eatie. Good night, folks. Thanks again, and see you next October. The last show of the season for the 38-39 season... Uh, Jack Benny, June 25th, 1939, on this final classic radio theater with Wyatt Cox on a Sunday on your favorite radio station. I want to thank the good folks at KXEL in Waterloo, Iowa, and so many other places that we have chatted with over the past uh, uh, eight years of doing this show. Uh, it, it has really been a pleasure to be with each and every one of you through those times. I also want to thank the folks at uh, WGMD. Uh, They've given us a great send-off as well. But I want to make it clear to people who didn't hear our conversations. uh, Quite frankly, uh, I I need to take a step back. 90 hours a week of working is not something that this old body can do too much longer. And uh, it's better that I... Step back while I still have some health, don't you know? All righty, an episode this hour, The Family Doctor, back in 1932, Error in Diagnosis. Hello there. This is The Family Doctor. Grave Miller. Going up to your office, are you? Yes, sir. Anything I can do for you? Well, no, I don't rightly know. I reckon so that'll be up to you. <laughs> well, I guess you're right, Griff. Well, come on up. Uh, uh, ain't as young as it used to be. Stairs kind of tucking me out. Well, I guess there isn't any hurry. We can take them slower. Uh, How's business at the boathouse, Griff? Oh, tolerable for this time of season, I reckon, but... Uh, Reckon as how this is going to be the last. Yep, the last. What? Oh, no. Gosh, to Friday, Griff, you've got a long time to live yet. Yep, I guess you're right, Doc. That's just the trouble. What do you mean? Oh, there ain't uh, nothing nobody can do about it. Just have to let it go, I guess. Yep. Mm. Oh, here's Lawyer Bates coming down the stairs. Howdy, Ralph. Yeah, howdy. Oh, now, when do you suppose it's fretting Ralph Bates? Uh, what's he? I said... Don't you know Lawyer Bates? Oh, yes, yep, I know him all right. But you didn't speak to each other. Yeah, that's right, nope. We didn't speak to each other, nope. Hmm. Yeah, step right in, Griff. Thank you. Can you sit right down, Doc? Kind of tuckered. Sure, it's right in that big chair. <sighs> Feels good. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Well, I'll tell you. For about a week now, I've been getting dizzy spells, sort of. Seeing the black spots in front of my eyes. Kind of worries me. Hmm. 
Take off your coat, Griff. <laughs> open up your shirt. Going to cut me open? <laughs> no, no. I'm just going to do a little sounding. <sighs> Griff? <laughs> Have you been doing any hard work on those boats of yours? Well, no, not to speak of. Got to keep them in shape, of course, but uh, I've been getting the Maynard twins to do the most of it. Pay them uh, 25 cents an hour after school. I see. Uh, <laughs> what's that for, Doc? All that thumping around in my chest. Oh, just trying out a theory. Mm. Now, Griff, when I place this stethoscope to your chest, mm. you just sit there in a natural like and breathe. Mm. That's it. Uh-huh. What is it, Doc? My, uh, my heart. Yes, Griff. It's your heart. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep, that's what I thought. How old are you, Griff? How old? Well, uh, let me see. Then I was too old to join up with T.R. and the Rough Riders in 98. Well, reckon I'm past 70. That's about all I can recollect. Now, you tell me the truth, young man. Haven't you been doing some extraordinary hard manual labor lately? No, 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 Doc. I swear I ain't. The Maynard twins have been doing it all. Then uh, you got something on your mind. Well, uh... What's fretting you? Oh, Doc, I can't stand it. Well, tell me about it. You know, a doctor has to keep lots of secrets. Uh, I guess that's right. Well, uh, it's this way. My daddy had that there boathouse up to Miller's Lake afore me, and his daddy afore him, Granddaddy Lice Miller, he discovered it. We Millers sort of took it for granted, I guess, that it, well, that it belonged to us. Yep, belonged to us. Well, doesn't it? Well, this is Saturday afternoon. It uh, belongs to us Millers. Maybe in the last belongs to us up till Monday morning. And what's going to happen then? Doc, Dr. Adams, I, I don't like to complain, none, but, well, truth is, I, I let myself in for a mortgage on the place three years ago. Just in order to get some new canoes and some of them newfangled outboard motors, as they call them. Yep, there's a mortgage on the place. And is the mortgage due now? No, 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 not that. The principal ain't due for another seven years, but, of course, there's always the interest to pay. Huh? Well, I told you how business has been pretty good this season, but it ain't, Doc. Doc, it, it ain't at all. It's been, well, as the young folks say, it's been lousy. Hmm. And you can't meet your interest payment right now, is that it? Uh, yep, that's it. Griff, who holds the mortgage on your property up there to the lake? Oh, well, uh, I don't think that makes no difference, Nope. It don't make... Griff? Uh, yep, Doc? Who holds that mortgage? Uh, well, uh, Lawyer Bates. That's what I thought. How's that? Never mind. Now, Griff, I'm going to give you some pellets to take. I want you to take these just as you get up in the morning, uh, and then just before you go to bed at night. Just as you say, Doc. Uh, two each time, twice a day. And don't you forget them. No, no, I won't. Reckon so they'll help a mite, Doc. Yes, they will. But they won't do it all. Griff, you've got to stop worrying about the boats or the canoes or outboard motors or the mortgage. You understand? Well, yep, Doc, I understand. I, I know what you're getting at, but... Uh... I said not to worry, Griff. I'm your doctor. You let me worry about everything. Well, thank you, Doc. It's mighty kind of you. Well, uh, uh, I reckon it's, uh, might as well be getting back to the lake. Well, thank you, Doc. I'll, uh, I'll pay you later for these here pills. Yep, I'll, I'll pay you later. Well, don't you worry about it, Griff. Just you take them and let me worry about the paying. And uh, drop in again, say, Monday morning. Well, thank you again, Doc. Well, good night. Yeah, good night, Griff. Well, Bates, the old skin flint, gosh, to Friday. And so help me, I don't think there's a thing I can do. <laughs> Bates, what in the name of good and bad's happened to you? How should I know? That's what I called you for, to find out. Where have you been? Called you an hour ago. Oh, well, you know what it is around the house Monday morning? No, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, let me take a look at you. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? Rotten. That's what I thought. What? Let me see your tongue. Uh, say, what's my tongue got to do with it? Uh, let me feel your pulse. Pulse? Well, all right. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. What is it, doctor? What is it? Varicella. What? Oh, good heavens, what's that? It sounds terrible. It is. It's chicken pox. Chicken pox? What did you say? Impossible. Chicken pox at my age. Impossible. Oh, no, it isn't impossible. It happens quite often. Sometimes it's quite dangerous, too, in men of your age, I mean. Dangerous? Oh, no, no, it can't be. Well, that's what it is. I'm certain of it. Chicken pox. And that means I'll have to place you in quarantine. Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. But uh, What? Quarantine? 
You can't do that. Uh, I've got business to do. Yeah. This is Monday morning. I've got a very important business transaction to take care of uh, today. You can't put me in quarantine. Now, now, Ralph, you mustn't carry on so. It's bad for your heart with oh. chicken pox. Yeah. Well, I'll give Pete May a prescription for you, and he can send it up with Johnny. Yeah. Mm. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, is this business transaction of yours anything I can take care of for you? Of course not. No small-town doctor has enough brains to take care of anything. I just lose it, that's all. Well, maybe he won't be able to raise it today. Let's hope so anyway. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. Well, I'll drop around again this evening, Ralph. I'll see you then. Chicken pox at my age. It's preposterous. That's what it is. Preposterous, I say. I never uh, let me see. Where will I put this sign? Right here, I guess. Uh, and there we are. Nice and yellow. <laughs> Quarantine. <laughs> How have you been feeling over the weekend? You look a lot better. Well, I feel better, Doc. Well, that's good. Uh, you haven't raised the interest on the mortgage yet, have you? No, no, I ain't. Thought while I was up here, I'd drop in on Lawyer Bates and tell him he might as well uh, take the place over. Uh, Lawyer Bates won't be in his office today, Griff. Oh, he won't? No, no, he won't be down. Uh, how much was that interest payment, Griff? $73.47. Mm-hmm, I see. Eh, yeah, just a minute. There you are, Griff. Uh, what's this, Doc? A prescription? Why, why, no. It's a check. A check for $75. I'm taking a lien on your new canoes and motors, Griff. Oh. Yes, take that check down to the bank right away and get Judge Windsor to apply it against Ralph Bates' interest claim. Oh. And then go on back to the lake and take a rest. Oh, I can't do this, Doc. I, I can't. Now listen, young man. Didn't I tell you last Saturday to let your doctor do a little worrying for you? Oh, Doc. How can I thank you? Say, uh, by the way, Griff, haven't you got a lot of poison oak up there around Miller's Lake? Poison oak? <laughs> Law me, doctors. There's tons of it. Wish I could get rid of it. Get rid of it? Oh, you'd better not, Griff. It may come in handy again sometime. What do you mean, leaving me all alone in this house all day without anybody to take care of me? With that plaguey yellow sign out there on my front stoop. How oh, now, Ralph? I told you to keep yourself calm. Uh, let me take a look at you. Hmm. There seems to be a little change. Change? Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like chicken pox this evening. What? What do you mean? What is it? It looks like poison oak. Poison oak? And you let me stay here. Uh, let me out of here. I've got to find Sam Windsor. I've got to foreclose that mortgage. Mortgage? Oh, uh, say, that reminds me. I saw Griff Miller this afternoon, uh, just after the bank closed. Griff Miller? Yeah. Told me he just paid the interest on his mortgage. <laughs> yeah, he felt pretty spry about it, too. Then, then it's too late. Hmm. Say, uh, by the way, speaking of your poison oak, Ralph, they tell me there's a lot of it up around Miller's Lake. You don't suppose that's where you caught yours, do you? Sort of surveying around and like... Grant Adams, you old fox. Hmm? You did that to me a purpose. Why, what do you mean, Ralph? You made me think I had that plague of chicken pox just to give Griff Miller time to pay off that interest. You knew all the time I didn't have chicken pox. Oh, Ralph, don't you realize you're scandalizing my professional ethics? Professional ethics? You're a doctor, Grant, and as such, you're bound to treat human ills. I guess you just can't help treating some of the mental ills of us humans along with the physical ones. Oh, now. I know I'm right. I can see it in your eyes. And Grant Adams, God bless you for it.
This is the family doctor. I'll be in to see you again right soon. Goodbye. A fun little show. Uh, I think we have 39 quarter hours of this show out there. The Family Doctor going back to 1932 here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Hey, we thank you for joining us. And again, I want to take a moment to thank everybody who has contacted us, everybody who uh, uh, has said thank you, uh, people who have said, why? Uh, And, you know, I'm going to tell you, my back's hurting sitting here right now doing the show. And I've got a lot more to do. Uh, It's just, I'm too old Too old to work 90 hours a week, and that's what I've been doing. Thank this station and support their advertisers, won't you please? Thank you for making us a part of your day here on this Sunday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.